John chapter 17, verses 1 to 26. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have, have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. You gave me them the words, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you gave me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and they continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thanks, Philip, and good morning, everybody. My name is John Forsyth. I have the privilege of being the vicar here at St Jude's and a very warm welcome to you uh, online or in person and particularly if it's your first uh, week with us at St Jude's. One of the amazing things about prayer, of which there are many amazing things, is it has the ability to reveal what our priorities are. In other words, we pray what is on our heart. And what is in our heart is what we pray. If you reflect back on your week, what you've prayed for, I think you'll find it correlates closely to what has been on your heart over the last week. Now, over the last uh, couple of weeks, we've been looking at this really amazing part of John's Gospel, uh, often referred to as Jesus' farewell discourse. And we've entitled this topic, uh, this section, Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled. And we've chosen those titles because it's where Jesus speaks to his close disciples before he goes to the cross. And he wants them not to be troubled because there are momentous events before him. And at the very end here in chapter 17, which is the kind of last bit of the, 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 the farewell discourse this morning, we see that Jesus prays. And he prays the longest prayer we have recorded that Jesus says in all of scriptures. In fact, it's pretty much the whole chapter. If you have one of those red letter Bibles, you know, your eyes are going crazy by the end of this chapter. There's so much red ink everywhere. Now, of course, as you've heard it read, you see, we actually cannot do justice to the depth of theology and insight in this prayer in one sermon. I wonder if you thought that as it was read. In fact, uh, Dean Martin Lloyd-Jones, a famous Welsh preacher, preached not not just four sermons on this topic, but four books of sermons on this topic. Uh, And so you're getting off lightly, that's all I'm saying this morning, as tempting as it was. I mean, as we look at at this passage, we get a glimpse, just astonishingly, in, in the heart of the Godhead, the Trinity, where Jesus speaks to the Father by the Spirit. Uh, That's just an incredible uh, 10 or 20 sermons just in that section alone. But I think just a a small but quite powerful takeaway from that moment is, uh, as this passage is primarily about prayer, it reminds us that prayer is not an invention but an invitation. Prayer is not an invention, but an uh, an invitation. Now, what I mean by that is God didn't just create humans in his own likeness and then think, oh, I wonder how they're going to communicate with me. Email, I know, I'll invent prayer. No, we see here that actually we are graciously and amazingly actually invited to join in in how God communicates within himself, within the Trinity. Jesus prays to the Father by the Spirit. And when we pray, because we're praying in Jesus' name and authority, we're doing the same thing, astonishingly, as Jesus does. We are praying to the Father through the Spirit. It's quite a profound reality to realise that prayer is not something God has invented humans, uh, for us humans to do, but a gracious invitation. Now that alone reminds us just the depth of the relational quality of prayer. Far too often we think of prayer as transactional. But no, it is relational, deeply relational, finding its roots in the Trinity. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, he says, the right way to pray is to stretch out our hands and ask of the one we know who has the heart of a father. That's what we see just very briefly in this this opening idea that Jesus prays. And we see as we go through this chapter, we can clearly see that Jesus' prayer falls into three parts. He firstly prays for himself and particularly for God's glory. He secondly prays for God's people, his disciples. And thirdly, then he prays for us and God's mission. 
And so I've kind of broken down the passage into three sections. He prays for God's glory, he prays for God's people, and he prays for God's mission. And as we look at these prayers, hopefully they will shape both our own priorities and our own prayers as a church. That we will be a church that prays first and foremost for God's glory and be a church that prays for God's people and be a church that prays for God's mission. So let's look at these one at a time. Firstly, Jesus prays for God's glory. We see this right at the very beginning of chapter 17. Uh, after Jesus had said this, he looked heaven, uh, towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. Now, this call for mutual glorification, uh, by the way, it's not just the first thing that Jesus prays for. It's actually the most important thing that Jesus prays for in this entire passage, that God is glorified. In fact, just in the opening verses, five times that word glory is mentioned. We can't miss it. And it's a reminder too, by the way, that when we pray, actually, God's glory should be the most important thing that we pray for. Often our prayers are inwardly focused, and there is absolutely a, a place for us to pray for our needs. But first and, uh, first and foremost, prayer is a call to glorify God. That word glory, by the way, it's, it's a bit of a, a tricky word to understand. It literally means a heaviness or weightiness, or, or permanence, importance, and, and, and eternal kind of greatness, by which everything else in comparison seems fleeting, and, and flimsy, and fragile, and temporary. And what this means is that because God is so glorious, everything else and, and everyone else is dependent upon the triune God for its existence and for its value and is therefore consequently of less value than God. In other words, the glory of God means that all things are dependent upon God and that all things are less valuable than God. And here Jesus is praying, notice too, that the hour has come. This is the hour where God's glory may be evident in me, your son, says Jesus, that he may make it evident in the Father. And this is particularly clear when we get to verse 4. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do, says Jesus. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So what, what is the kind of reason for all this glory that Jesus is praying for in these verses? What is this glorious work the Father has given Jesus? Well, a seemingly unglorious thing, to be crucified on the cross, to bear the judgment of the sins of the world. And humanly speaking, the cross is actually as seemingly far from glorious as possible. So inglorious, in fact, that it was a cultural icon of disgrace, not glory. No author in the first century would celebrate it and talk about the glory of the cross. No poet would wax, uh, wax lyrical about its beauty. Yet on the cross was where God showcased his glory and majesty. You see, the cross, uh, it, particularly in John's Gospel, it is the beginning of the exaltation of Jesus, where he is lifted up in glory. He will reflect to the universe the Father's glory, ironically, on a cross. And the Father's glory will shine in and through the Son. Why on earth is the cross glorious? And the answer is because it shows that Jesus' work is complete. 
to come and redeem and rescue his people and grant them eternal life. As it says in verse 2, For you have granted him, that is Jesus, authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those uh, you have given to him. That, that's the reason why the cross is so glorious. From the glory of the cross to the glory of the resurrection and the ascension and the enthronement of the Lord Jesus Christ as the eternal sovereign king over all things. That is the glory that Jesus is speaking of here. See, friends, to have an encounter with God in prayer means that we too must be powerfully shaped by his glory. See, God shakes us and arranges us. God is heavier and weightier. It is God's agenda when we pray. And therefore, God's agenda and glory should be at the heart of our prayer. Interesting, actually, how when Jesus teaches us to pray, what's the very first thing he teaches us? Our Father in heaven, hallowed, may your name, may your authority be holy. He starts by giving glory to God, the Father. Jesus prays for God's glory, and as a church, that should be the place where we start. It should shape our priority as we look to excitingly start a new congregation at four. We've got this wonderful bunting and lights and, and balloons, more hot air than normal on a Sunday, right? Why do we do that? Well, part of it's a celebration. Part of it is to say, yes, it's exciting. It's exciting because God, we pray, will get more glory as a result. That's what we're celebrating ultimately. That's why we plant another congregation. So God will be glorified. That message of Christ, the cross, will be proclaimed. We pray to more people. God is glorified. So we have balloons. And we have bunting. And we sing. And we pray. And we celebrate. God, uh, Jesus prays for God's glory. Secondly, we see that Jesus prays for God's people. It's in verse uh, 6 and following. Notice that throughout these verses, Jesus refers to his disciples as those belonging to the Father. See that throughout the, 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 those, those verses there? Now, uh, my grandmother, uh, who is now with the Lord, uh, an amazing woman, uh, she was involved in lots of things at church, and one of them was the choir. Uh, and there was this new woman who joined the choir, and my grandma was very welcoming and had a chat to her, invited her around for um, a cup of tea afterwards in church. And this woman had recently become a grandmother. Now, if you know a recently become grandmother, what you'll know is they will have between two to 3,000 photos of that child uh, on their phone. And the grandmother's like, maybe more. Uh, this is back in the day when there were just printed photos. So it was just in the low hundreds. Uh, and she was so proud to show my grandma her granddaughter. She is mine. And so my grandma said, can I bring a photo next week of my grandchildren? And so my uh, grandmother brought in a photo of a whole bunch of kids, and I think there's about 24 of them in the photo. And the woman said, which, which one of these are your grandchildren? She said, all of them. 24 grandchildren that she had. They belong to me. They are mine. There was this, this sense of pride. Sense of grandmotherly care and affection for them. Look at verse 6. I have revealed to you those whom you gave to me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And then to verse 9, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. It's the same kind of language, isn't it? It's as if God has his little selection of photos. <laughs> See, that, Peter, Adam, that cute one, he's mine. That's right. And notice that these disciples, these followers, are the fathers because they obeyed the word. Look at the second half of verse 6. 
They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I have given them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. Do you see the, the way that following and trusting the word is basically hand in hand with being someone who belongs to God? In other words, God's words are for God's people. And God's words tell us everything we need to know about Jesus. And so we must continue to be a church which prioritises God's word because that is what God's people need to grow in our knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus and of each other. And notice there's a kind of centrifugal, I think is the word, uh, force happening with these words. It starts with the Father, and the Father says, look, I've given these words to me, says Jesus. And then Jesus gives the words to the disciples, and we'll see in verse 20, the disciples give the words to other people. The the word isn't stationary, it kind of of heads outwards, it's flung out to the world. God the Father, God the Son, the disciples, the world. And we'll see a bit later on, that, that is God's mission. To continue to share God's word about God's son to God's world. So what does Jesus then pray for his people, for the disciples? Well, he prays that they'll be protected from the evil one and sanctified. Uh, For example, in verse 11, we read... Holy Father, by the way, that's the only time God is referred to as Holy Father in all of Scripture. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. So what's Jesus saying here? Well, we need to understand a bit about what is meant by name. Uh, It's not just uh, the name Jesus, although that is an amazing name. Uh, The word name in Scriptures is really a substitute for Uh, the the powerful presence uh, and authority of a person. It carries uh, the idea of the the deep-seated authority. It's like when you say, you know, the kind of the old-fashioned movie, stop in the name of the law, under the authority of the law. And so what do Jesus' disciples need protection from? Well, Jesus gives us the answer in verses 14 and following. He says in verse 14, I've given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. And verse 15, which we have behind us, my prayer is not uh, you are taken them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word, there's that phrase again, Your word is truth. Now, the idea of the world in John's Gospel is is not kind of uh, geology or geography, certainly to all your geologists and geographies out there. It's actually a deeply theological concept. In fact, it's used almost 80 times in John's Gospel. And what we see as we read John's Gospel is that the world is all of that that is in rebellion to God, that stands against him. And you can go right back to the very beginning of John's Gospel in what's called the prologue when we read that Jesus was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. So the first aspect of the world is it's the world in opposition to God. But at the same time, the world is the very thing that Christ has come to save and that God loves. Throughout John's Gospel, Jesus is called the Saviour of the world, the Light of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we had this tension. The world is in rebellion, but the world is also deeply loved, and it's for which Christ has come to redeem it. But it, but it is a good reminder for us Christians that we don't live on neutral ground. We don't live on neutral ground. So Jesus prays that although we live in this world, we don't belong to it. We belong to the Father. That is the same for us. There'll be times where this world seems just in blatant opposition to what God wants. We should not be surprised. That's normal. 
What's our response? Well, our response is the same as God the Father. We are to love the world. (laughs) You see, that can be difficult, can't it? That can be challenging. That can be hard. Don't be surprised when we bump up against the world's values. And the response is, love the world. Because we belong to the Father. And so Jesus asks that we are protected from the world and sanctified for the Father. See that in verse 17? It says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Literally, sanctify them in truth. What does that mean that that Jesus prays that his disciples, his followers, are sanctified by or in the truth? Well, we need to kind of unpack that word sanctified. It's the same word as holy. And it means at its heart to be set apart for a special purpose, particularly in this case, context, to serve God. Set apart to serve God. If you belong to God, therefore you're set apart for God. Uh, I kind of try to find an analogy. I've used the, you know, the, the fancy plates analogy a few times when the kid comes around to get the fancy plates out, not the everyday plates. They're your, they're your holy, sanctified plates. I was thinking perhaps it's like a wedding dress. It's sanctified, it's set apart for a special purpose. It's not for everyday wear. And so Jesus is praying that the Father will sanctify or set apart his followers, that by their words and actions, it's very clear that they belong to the Father and that they don't belong to the world. And brothers and sisters, that should be our prayer as well. As we seek to live as God's people, we pray that we will live in a way which shows this world that we belong to God. Once again, it picks up some of the language from the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done on earth as in heaven and also deliver us from evil. They should be the marks of our church here at St. Jude's. Well, thirdly, we see that God, uh, Jesus prays for God's mission in verses 20 to 26. And this is quite amazing, actually, because I wonder if you notice that Jesus actually prays for you in this passage. Like, it's, it's, quite, it's quite powerful, actually. He prays for you. Before you were born, he was praying for you. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Those who will believe in me through their message. It's it's those who haven't seen Jesus with their own eyes, like those first disciples yet, have heard with their ears the amazing and beautiful truth of the gospel and follow Jesus. They are the people Jesus prays for. He prays for you and me. And this is what he prays for us. It's in the very next verse. He prays that all of them, all of us, may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Then to verse 22. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Can can you see the logic of what Jesus is praying here? There's a goal, right? The goal is that they, that we, are one, just as the Lord Jesus and God the Father are one. But it doesn't end there. There's there's a mission or a purpose or a goal beyond that. And that is so that the world may believe that Jesus has been sent. That's, That's the end point of this unity. It's not just unity for unity's sake. It's unity so the world goes, wow, I wonder what's behind that. And it becomes evident Jesus is behind that unity. So what does it mean to be one? What what does it actually look like then? Is Jesus praying that all churches and denominations kind of merge together into some kind of huge church? Uh, I don't think so. Not that there's uh, not good or bad things around that. Uh, It's a slightly anachronistic view of church, firstly. 
Uh, and secondly, that's, that's a structural and organisational unity that often is culturally uh, sensitive to different cultures. And also, I think it's unlikely to win the world to Christ, to advertise Christ. Uh, mergers and acquisitions don't usually kind of say, oh, look at the love those people have for each other. They've merged, as exciting as that is. Now, I think actually that oneness and unity that Jesus prays for is actually something far more important than structural unity and actually far more profound. It is a radical unity as a loving community where barriers of social standing, such as race and age and gender and education and language, are gone. See, in Jesus' day, society was extremely diverse, yes, but extremely divided and separate. Groups did not mix. There was no such thing as multiculturalism. Uh, religion particularly was divided upon uh, racial and cultural lines, extremely so. Gods were considered local, a bit like football teams here in Melbourne. Uh, and even to suggest that Jews and Gentiles could worship together, uh, it was so shocking. So much of the early church have fights about this because they can't comprehend this fact. What do you mean Jews and Gentiles together? Makes no sense. Women and men on the same level? It makes no sense. Children and slaves, the same value as the emperor? That's ludicrous. See, Christianity was actually the first multi-ethnic religion. It radically says each and every person is made in God's image. From the newborn baby to the emperor of Rome. Male and female, slave, free, Jew, Gentile, all made in God's image. And forgiveness and new life is one in Christ and available to all. That's the unity. No sexism, no racism, no ageism, no classism. We are all one in Christ. And we kind of forget that because Jesus has so influenced our multicultural view in the West, it's become normal. Uh, so I've got this slide here to show you just actually to try and remind us just how radical it is. Now on the left, you might recognise a relatively handsome man, let's say. Uh, we won't talk about him too much. Uh, far more importantly is the woman on the right. Her name is Betty. Uh, she's an Indigenous woman, uh, unsure of her age, uh, probably late 70s to 80s, from Nuka, which is uh, an Indigenous community in the Northern Territory. It's where Zoe, one of our global mission partners, is working at the moment. Uh, and Nuka is a short eight hour drive from Darwin, uh, mostly on dirt roads. You can ask Philippa Lohmeyer Collins about the drive there with me once. She's got very fond memories, don't you, Philippa? <laughs> now, culturally speaking, uh, Betty and I are about as opposite as you can get on this earth. Uh, there's cultural differences. There are language differences, there are age differences, there are gender differences, there are location differences, there are climate differences, there are ways of living that is different, there are family values that are different. Anglo culture and indigenous culture are actually two cultures that are almost opposite in so many ways of all the cultures on this earth. Now, it's not just that we're different, I'm also part of a Anglo-colonial culture, which has destroyed so much of indigenous culture and caused so much pain and affliction to indigenous people. So it's not just that we're different, there's also uh, understandably uh, a, a rift. These two people in the photo are about as far from each other culturally as there is to be. Yet, uh, when we're up there most days, Betty would pop over for a cup of tea and a chat and we'd have fellowship together uh, both white fella and indigenous people every night. But I'll never forget the word she said to me one day. She looked me in the eye and she said, I thank God for the arrival of the Europeans at Botany Bay. Because they brought the good news with them. I thank God for the arrival of the Europeans at Botany Bay. For they brought the good news with them. 
Isn't that a stunning thing to say? And there's no other answer than that's the power of the gospel. <laughs> there's no human reason why she would ever say that. Why would an indigenous person say, I thank God for the arrival of the Europeans? That is the radical unity that Jesus prays about. There's no other answer than that is an answered prayer. That is Jesus' prayer answered in our lifetime. Can you see how radical the gospel is? That's Jesus' mission. To bring people from all different backgrounds and races and religions. It's not just eternal life, which is astonishing. We then become one community and one body. A body that includes Betty and includes John. Because the gospel of the Lord Jesus is not just the only thing, or well, one of the few things that Betty and I would have in unity, it's actually the most important thing that we have in unity together. It's an overwhelming unity. It's a unity that allows her to say that. And how can that not lead people to ask, what on earth is happening? What on earth makes this unity happy? Well, it can only be Jesus. That's the only answer possible. God's mission is to make Christ known, and that's our mission too. We are to make known the irresistible beauty of Christ, which was so evident in her words and in her grace. And the challenge is, of course, well, <laughs> is that evident in our church? And in the way we treat people and love people? Is there evidence at St. Jude's of a community of, a, of this level of astounding love? Or are we more happy with awkward individuality, with our Western mindset, where it's about me and God, not about us and God? The challenge is, I think, sometimes we fall into the trap of rather than displaying the irresistible beauty of Christ, which Betty did, we have a tendency at times to make Jesus ugly to the world. Not that he is ugly, but we distort him. We fail to make people feel welcome. We can, we can gossip. We can be clicky. We can have hearts that tend towards complaint and, bicker, and bickering. We fail to bear one another's burdens. In fact, we don't want to hear anyone else's burdens, let <laughs> alone bear their burdens. We're too busy, too distracted, too indifferent. But look what Jesus says in verse 26. I have, made, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. In other words, we should be people who are deeply soaked in the love of God. So much so that it kind of leaks out everywhere and you know, you can't help but get it all over you. The God's love is just there. And what is this love? Well, it's the love that, that is quoted in the, the kind of most famous verse of Scripture. It's John 3.16, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Because that is the love that glorifies God the most. And that is the love that God has for his people. And that is the love that drives God's mission. So let us pray that this love will be at the center of all we do. Whether you're staying here at 10, whether you're going to four, whether you're visiting from somewhere else, may God's love shape all we do as we seek to pray for God's glory to pray for God's people and to pray for God's mission. I'm going to pray just for those things. In a moment, we're going to stand together and sing a song which asks God to hear our prayer, an appropriate way to respond. Let's pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, these are truly astounding words in John 17. We thank you for the extraordinary privilege of prayer the invitation to join 
in communicating with you. Father, may our prayer and priority be shaped by Jesus. May we seek to first glorify you and Jesus in all we say and do. May we as your people be sanctified and protected. And may we as your people have a great passion and love to demonstrate the beauty of Christ to this world, to proclaim that message with the love that you show for this world. Amen.